Um, so, so what actually will or does competency-based education do to uh, higher education system is that it will shift higher education uh, system away from uh, the disciplinary divisions because competency, it's well-defined competency will encompasses all the different disciplines. It's not only in, in one narrowly defined discipline. So in order to acquire competence, uh, the student have to go through different um, disciplines. So it will be in nature interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, and it will be will make the institution or higher education systems away from the disciplinary divisions. And also um, we have the division of formal, informal, and non-formal education, and those um, divisions will become blurred when we actually go into the serious uh, competency-based education because it doesn't matter where students learn. Students may learn in, in classroom, students may learn in some um, institution, or they may actually use online, um, uh, online learning resources and just learn on their own. Um, it doesn't really matter how they learn, but if we assess the student competency well in them, um, the institution won't be stuck in one form. And in terms of um, the time as well, we don't have to be stuck in terms of four-year or two-year institutions, because it could be three-year, it could be one year. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter. It may take actually longer, six years or 10 years even, but as long as the learner or student wants to acquire certain competency, um, the education system or education institution should provide some form to, for student to be able to do that. Um, so it's also shift away from instructor-based teaching. The university and higher education institutions um, has been so instructor-based. And, and we, instructor, decide what to teach because students really don't know, don't have any idea. So instructor uh, decide curriculum, instructor decide the content, uh, instructor decide um, everything. But in the competency-based system education, of course, a student, some, many students need some guidance. Um, and we have to provide guidance. We, we have to provide some kind of pathways for students to go through to acquire competencies. And it may be depending on the student learning style, students, um, the different need in terms of daily, daily activities and so forth. But we have to give some kind of, we have to give some kind of guidance uh, for students to go through that pathway. And, and um, um, we, we've been talking about this time-based Carnegie unit system, and, and which um, in US, actually, in the States, now getting a big talk about getting rid of, or not really getting rid of, but uh, it's kind of challenging the way universities are based on the Carnegie unit, but it's our system. And um, this, this, this um, author, the Thai, Tayak and Kuban uh, in, in Tinkering Utopia in 1995 says that the Carnegie kind of unit has frozen schedules, separated knowledge into discrete boxes, and created an accounting mentality better suited to a bank than to a school. So that's an um, interesting sentiment expressed in 1995, uh, which is um, 20 years ago. So um, I, I think this is kind of redundant. I've discussed that already. The promise of uh, competency-based education is that it can assure uh, the quality and extent of learning, shorten the time. There's a possibility. It, it may be actually lengthening the time, but there is a possibility of also shortening the time to degree in certificate completion and develop stackable credentials and reduce overall cost of education. And um, so, as I said, in order to actually for competency-based education to, to become possible, we have to have really well-defined competency uh, framework. And that has been a big challenge because there are so many competencies we can think of. And some of them are very concrete and easily defined. And more vocationally oriented competencies are easily defined than, um, than more abstract uh, competencies. But 
we are getting close to defining even so-called not really concrete, not vocationally oriented competencies, uh, such as like creative thinking and, and critical thinking, uh, creativity and, and so forth. Uh, but, but in doing so, we have to really know, we have to have the method of assessment. Um, combining all the different methodologies, standardized testing, objective testing, portfolio, e-portfolio, authentic evaluation, direct assessment, we have to actually, um, still we, we haven't really got to the point where we can actually confidently say that we can do performance assessment very, uh, very well. Um, but, but we are getting, I think, close to there with the help of technology. And there have to be much, much more research need to be done to actually make this one happen. And um, there is a good example of competency framework done by Lumina Foundation in the States. And uh, they actually put forth a degree qualification profile. And in degree pro qualification profile, they um, defined those uh, competencies as applied learning, intellectual skills, specialized knowledge, broad knowledge, civic learning. And they actually detail, detailed um, each of those uh, qualification And there's another example, it's a LEAP, uh, Liberal Education and America's Promise Initiative. And it's also, uh, they also try to define um, those um, competencies which need to be or should be acquired after the graduation of one of the universities and colleges. So those are the uh, competencies they define. And there is actually a big movement in the States, which I'm trying to follow closely. Um, and, and following those movements in the States at this moment, maybe in sooner uh, than we expect, the higher education institutions will be forced to change uh, dramatically in coming years. Because nowadays, the US government is saying that they will actually give um, the loans or scholarship to those educational programs which use direct assessment. Direct assessment is a competency-based program. Um, and I just wanted to talk about um, MOOCs actually go hand in hand with CBE pretty well because MOOCs is a platform to provide learning resources. And then if we can actually assess the student learning uh, who, who use MOOCs to learn, but um, not very good way to be assessed. Although Coursera and, and uh, some other MOOCs are trying very hard to, to do that assessment part as well. So, um, since I don't really have much time, um, I'm, I'm, I wanted to introduce some of the initiative and, and um, activities done by uh, MOOCs. Uh, Udacity is trying to do the Open Education Alliance and offer nano degrees. It's another credentialing system, um, which actually in partnership with industries. And Sigurdjus Track is the Coursera's um, credentialing system. And they actually trying to, to work the system out to make sure that authentication system is really uh, trustable. And um, so they um, developed those systems to authenticate uh, learners for credentialing. So at the University of Tomorrow, uh, we'll have a significant online component and uh, we'll be very student-centered. I think um, the students now uh, are demanding that uh, instruct, uh, instruction or education should be more student-centered. And it's more personalized and customized. And um, uh, one thing is that I'm pretty sure that higher education institution of tomorrow will become unbundled, uh, which means that um, um, the student, uh, the higher education institution so far have been doing everything, everything in terms of uh, provision of learning resources, assessment of learner performance, and supporting learners, all of those things uh, one uh, institution has been doing, but in the future, in the probably near future, those um, components of function of university will become um, maybe unbundled. 
and there are some experts in providing learning resources and some expert institution to, to do assessment and some expert institutions to do uh, the learning, learner support. And so those experts in different fields will work together and provide higher education institution. I think that will be the future of our University of Tomorrow. And uh, I'm sorry, the time is up and I will conclude my presentation here. Thank you. It's a big challenge to give a talk after lunch. I'm glad to see everyone's really awake. This is, my, my previous two speakers have been really lively, so hopefully I could uh, uh, match with them. Uh, one thing for sure is that I think everyone in this room is uh, up to date with the same uh, view of where, where things are heading. I think we're talking about the same thing. Uh, very often it's an uh, overlap uh, of concepts that uh, in fact, my, a lot of my talks uh, is already uh, presented by my uh, two previous speakers, so I'll be very quick. <laughs> um, educating Generation Alpha. Uh, um, generation Alpha is, uh, is a generation that's being born right now. And uh, I, I, I named this talk uh, Educating Generation Alpha because those are the future, our future uh, students. And it'll be interesting to uh, try to guess, you know, what are their behaviors or what are their learning patterns and what are their learning preferences. So um, in preparation for this talk, I thought it might be interesting to see, to borrow ideas from popular culture on uh, what people imagine the University of Tomorrow will be like. So I looked up uh, 50 years ago, uh, popular culture, on uh, you know, what will field trip be like. So the Jetsons, I'm sure most of you are too, too young to have no seeing this. <laughs> uh, but it was on TV when I was growing up. <laughs> so 50 years ago, they imagined that in the future, uh, it will still be a lecture-like uh, class. Uh, there will be a blackboard. Uh, there's uh, some sort of electronic devices on students' desks. Uh, the only main difference is that our teacher is replaced by a robot. Somehow, uh, a robot uh, replacing a human is, is an advancement. I don't know <laughs> if that is, uh, is true or not. Uh, it might be, uh, because I've heard this morning, I think Dr. Carlson mentioned that in Korea, you have robots teaching students already. So this is probably very accurate. Another comic strip is called Closer Than We Think. Uh, it's very similar. They imagine the future is still going to be a lecture-like environment. There's technology on students' desks. Somehow the teacher is virtual elsewhere. So it's more like a remote distance learning kind of environment. In the New York World's Fair in 1964, they paint a pretty accurate uh, picture of the future where students have access to computers and various learning tools and devices to help them with their learning, sort of like the, the MOOC that we have now. Back then, that was 50 years ago. So you take a photo of a typical class in a university 50 years ago, this is what they might look like. If we took a photo of a typical class in a university now, what would be different? <laughs> I did some Photoshop trick. <laughs> You're correct. <laughs> so instead of blackboard, you have whiteboard, and then <clears throat> everyone's in color. But that's not necessarily true. I think a lot of uh, your university, in particular, are using more innovative way of teaching, blended learning, flipped classroom, uh, MOOC, uh, as etc. So some of you mentioned nothing has changed. That is very accurate because, in fact, not much has changed for 1,000 years. This is an oil painting of a typical lecture 1,000 years ago. You have the typical dynamics. The most attentive students are at the front, the people in the back dozing off, <laughs> talking. So is that true? I mean. Nothing's going to change. I mean, we talk a lot about technology. We talk a lot about innovation. We talk about, a lot about new pedagogies. Will the future be the same? Hmm. 
Well, I decided to, 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 to look up what people nowadays think of the future. So this is one person's envisioning of the future is that instead of black and white, in the future everything's white, of course, we, we see that from, from movies. And instead of a blackboard, you have a video board. That's kind of pessimistic. A more um, adventurous uh, imagination of future uh, you can see from Star Trek uh, 2009 version. I don't know how many of you saw this movie. Uh, this is the Vulcan school that Spark uh, went to when he was young. So they envisioned that uh, uh, in the future, students are able to learn in a highly interactive environment uh, where, where knowledge is presented to them in highly visual form and they're communicating with, with with this environment. Sort of like a MOOC, right? You know, <laughs> you, you students working, studying by themselves, a lot of material, a lot of very visual material presented to them. In The Matrix, the first one, I'm sure most of you have seen this movie, but that, that actually is not too far from reality because uh, that reminds me of uh, when my little daughter, when she was like nine or 10, she asked to buy her a, a, a Rubik's Cube. He says, well, we could buy you a cube, but I don't know how to you know, work it myself. And you know, no one's going to teach you. He said, don't worry. So we bought her the cube. The first thing she did is she went on, on, on to, uh, YouTube, watched a few videos. By the end of the day, she knows how to solve any random cube. By the end of the week, she could do it in under one minute. True story, my, my, my daughter. So this is, this is pretty much close to, to this. Instead of a few seconds, a few, instead of one day, well, she, she learned one day. Uh, you know, you, you get a lot of information uh, directly, you know, fr from, from free sources. Okay, so those, those are the, from popular culture, but back to reality. <laughs> um, the University of Tomorrow, why should we be concerned? So you're all here because you are concerned about something. You think that the University of Tomorrow uh, there might be some changes. So what are the, the threats or opportunities that interest us so much? I think the main threat is that there is a big explosion of different technologies in the past decade. Uh, some people call this Education 3.0. So it started with um, roughly uh, 10, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, with the internet boom, there's you know, Google and so forth, and then gradually it you know, exploded to a tremendous amount of readily, readily available technologies and platforms and knowledge sources, and most of them are free. First of all, um, content is freely available. In the past, in order to get knowledge, you have to go to a university because that's where all the books are, that's where all the professors are. Now, you just Google for anything, you have a thousand related pages, you go on YouTube, there is a lecture, literally a lecture on any subject that you wish to learn on YouTube, and there's thousands of videos. And the list goes on. So we take a look at a few of these popular platforms. I think most of you are aware of Khan Academy, uh, you know, 4,500 videos, uh, millions of views, five million exercises per day, 10 million users per month. There's TED, you know, close to 2,000 videos, each, you know, 10 to 18 minutes long. Some people say that the success of these TED videos is that the videos are short. There's an 18 minute rule, could not be longer than 18 minutes. Whereas our lectures are very often one, two, or even three hours long. <laughs> Maybe we're, we're doing something wrong there. Uh, billions of views each uh, altogether. There's SlideShare. You know, one of the reasons our students go to class is that they, they want a copy of the PowerPoint, right? But with SlideShare, there's 10 million PowerPoints <laughs> online. You get PowerPoints from any, uh, a lot of professors readily available. MIT is make, has made all the courses, contents, uh, homeworks, assessments online for free. 
Besides free content, there's a lot of platforms where students could learn from each other, from others. A lot of social media, you know, of course, the Facebook and so forth. But there's also uh, private networks like Ning, Group PS, and then a lot of you know, commercial platforms, Office 365, Google Plus, Google Apps, et cetera, that allows people to easily communicate and share uh, information, ask questions, learn from each other. Of course, there's a MOOC that everyone's been talking about. Um, this is just one, one slide to show the impact of MOOC. Just within a short two or three years, the number of MOOC courses have increased from zero to over a thousand. One of the most popular platform is Coursera. They start with zero students three years ago. Now they have 22 million students. Imagine you setting up a university. Uh, Start from zero, how many students do you think you have enrolled in three years? Definitely not 22 million. I'm gonna talk a bit faster because I think my time's running out. And there's a lot more. There's uh, activities in adaptive learning. There's activity in just-in-time uh, courses, boot camps, etc. One of the boot camp uh, courses, boot camps are where you go and study one thing for a short period of time, maybe one semester, two months, three months. One of them is Flatiron um, School, which is in New York City. And they did a comparison of a four-year degree and a, uh, I think this is a, a free, free month, uh, oh, a 16 weeks uh, course. Instead of spending four years, you know, spent three months, in spending, instead of spending uh, uh, 62 uh, so thousand, spent uh, 15,000. And their statistics is that uh, their students make well, close to double. And the graduation rate is close to 100%. So what would be uh, Generation Alpha be like? So well, let's take a look at Generation Z. These are the students that we're teaching right now. Generation Z, they're digital native, they're uh, 